Hi, and welcome to the Grind Academy podcast. My name is Rob Patterson, and not so long ago, I traded my suits, my tuxedo, and a comfortable CEO lifestyle to become an entrepreneur. I now speak internationally. I've written a book. I created a clothing brand and started the Grind Academy podcast. I started the podcast with one purpose in mind, to be a platform for sharing experiences and practical life skills not taught at school. Growing up, I relocated several times and often struggled to fit in at new places. My academic grades suffered and eventually I finished school without a formal education. I did graduate, however, from the Academy of Life and eventually became CEO for one of Great Britain's largest hotel chains. It was practical life skills, learning to dream limitlessly and consistent grind that guided me on my journey. That's why each week I'm introducing experienced and talented minds from sport, business, literature, and science who have gained invaluable life learnings. I wanna share their stories as practical life lessons you can learn from and apply to your own personal situation. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Now let's hear about today's special guest. I've experienced firsthand how a production company can twist the truth to create an entertainment program for television. They'll insert awkward pauses that never happened. They'll stitch together footage filmed days or even months apart to create a scene that appears in real time. They'll use clever voiceovers to position a scene the way they want it to be consumed. The people who create these TV programs have no regard for the destruction they cause in personal lives. Their only interest is to sell a TV program and capture eyeballs. My next guest knows this all too well, having been personally taken out of context by major publications such as the New York Times. The section of society he represents were perhaps most famously and sensationally depicted by the Netflix docuseries Doomsday Preppers. James Walton is the head of Preppers Broadcasting Network. PBN in the US. James was the exact opposite of what mainstream media has made preppers out to be. If you did happen to watch the Doomsday Preppers TV series, you might expect an overly paranoid extremist coming live from a bunker in the Montana mountains. In reality, James is a calm, collected, articulate, caring father who lives a reasonable and normal life. James lives with a belief of taking insurance against the unthinkable. In recent times, the unthinkable has been happening, and at this point in time, who knows what's on the horizon? The beauty of podcasting is that it's unabridged, unregulated content. No major financial powers are influencing the agenda, and people can feel safe to air their honest views and opinions. And we all don't have to agree. The evolution of humanity re relies upon attempting to understand each other's perspectives, respecting that many people have a very different view to your own, and that's okay. There's some very practical advice in the podcast that we, all, we can all benefit from. I'm a big fan of homesteading for health and environmental reasons, and James shares why homesteading is also a great preparation for potential global disruptions. This podcast is all about real practical experience gained from the Academy of Life, and James shares the lessons he's learned from the truth he lives. Let's welcome James Walton to the podcast. James, thanks for joining the Grind Academy. I really appreciate you joining the podcast. Um, I'm from Australia. You can probably pick up from the accent. I lived out in the UK. I moved over here in July, and and I was really intrigued when uh, when when you wrote and um, and met, talked about preppers, and I hadn't heard of that term before. And I've since done a lot of research. So I wonder if we might start there. If you could just give us a bit of a, a summary of what is a prepper um you know how did it come about and tell us a little bit about the network that you're involved in or you've started yeah sure rob thanks so much for having me on man uh we had a little chat beforehand sounds like you got a bunch of booking so i'm glad i made it in <laughs> made it into the cut here um yeah so uh you know born out of i guess the cold war era um where groups of people who kind of started to understand the threat of nuclear weapons and and sort of what a nuclear exchange between Russia and America could do to the planet. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure that's where the survivalist base sort of began. And uh, that sort of group of survivalists wrote a bunch of books. They did a lot of, of 
different things under the radar, like from about the 60s all the way up till around the mid 90s to Y2K ish era. Um, and around the Y2K time is when I think more of a civilian, the, the survivalist groups were kind of more militaristic. They usually had military background, military understanding, which is why they knew so much about these nuclear weapons and the things that could happen. Um, and I think around that time, around the break of the 21st century is when more people, more regular people started saying, hey, maybe I could do some extra things, store some extra things, learn some new skills to be better prepared for whatever eventuality. You know, I think the uh, the growth of of mass media and the ability for people to see sort of disasters like on their television firsthand and read more about how things went, you know, Katrina was a big one. S events like that spurred more of these people to decide, like, it's time to do a little more to be a little more prepared. Um, and in the early days, you know, probably the most notable prepper um event or show or, or way that people really got to know preppers was through uh, Doomsday Preppers, which was a show on Nat Geo. I don't know if you ever saw Doomsday Preppers, um, but it was wildly popular show. And, you know, they, they, they were making a TV show. So they yeah. took some, they took some people who were a little wacky. They took some people who are really great people and made them look a little wacky. Some friends of mine, and, uh, you know, they made a good show, a good entertaining show that got prepping sort of more eyes on it than ever before. Uh, but for a long time, I think people were still not really bought into the idea of storing a bunch of stuff, you know, before probably the pandemic. I think a lot of people were thinking, you know, the government is well enough to take care of us in a, in a bad situation or, you know, maybe our local community will be fine. Things will never get as bad as they have gotten lately. <laughs> I think a lot of people believed that for a long time. And, uh, you know, all through those events that were happening, Rob, the, the prepping community itself was sort of growing and changing in a very big way. Uh, early on, prepping was, a, was really a lot about putting up a lot of extra food. It was a lot about doing some gardening, maybe things like that, but making sure that, uh, if it all fell apart, you'd be able to survive and you'd have enough stuff sort of packed away to do that. Um, it, it, the survivalist community, the prepper community, the homesteading community has now kind of all twirled up together and uh, it's created this really cool new movement that is just people living what we call at the Prepper Broadcasting Network self-reliant and independent lifestyles. Yeah. You know, so our, our sort of tagline is self-reliance and independence. And it's been that way since the, the network started in 2008 um, and not much has changed. But there's been a much bigger focus as of late on, you know, renewable energy. Uh, homesteading, if I could show you my I could twist my camera out the backyard and you can see the chickens running around out there. Yeah. But we've got a bunch of prepper friends who are raising goats and quails and chickens and rabbits and all kinds of uh, livestock in urban, suburban and rural areas and really kind of taking hold of uh, food sources. You know what I mean? Being able to produce their own food, not just buy a bunch of it stored in a closet somewhere and, you know, learning sort of what we call forgotten skills. You know what I mean? Skills that people have known just for so long, Rob, I always say that the human race has gone through something of like a 100 to 150 year amnesia, where just skills and, and things that we've known from as far back as people were people, as far back as you could call people, people, you know, um, we've just kind of forgotten completely in this little short span of time. And a lot of that is being wrapped up into prepping now. And, and you know, it's a very rewarding lifestyle the end of the day yeah it is i mean i grew up in australia on a farm with no access to water and we had to produce our own food our own. so it, that lifestyle is very familiar for me and i agree sure. with you it's, it's kind of been lost there's a health element that sticks not just a survival element but a health element that sits around as well you pick up a can of i don't know can of, I, I can't even say i can't believe i'm saying that can of vegetables Mm -hmm. can to start with and you can yeah. read the label and you're not i'm not sure what half that stuff is um so what would you say i guess if um you know a lot, a lot of people will probably think um you know it's 
can't be that bad. You know, life's doomsday is not there. Why does mainstream media kind of suppress and, and want to create a, movie, a TV show like Doomsday Preppers? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there are days when I feel like uh, they're just do the, the government itself has to avoid panic. You know what I mean? We saw we, we got an eye full of panic, you know, all through 2020 and, and the effect that it can have. And if we have a public that's on panic all the time, obviously life won't work the way we like it to work. You know, so there's days like that when I think, you know, the government is trying to maintain, you know, using the news and that kind of thing, trying to maintain a little bit of sort of societal composure. Right. Because we got to have it. There's no denying that, um, you know, but. Then there are days where I where I feel like I, I don't know it's it's almost there's just too much out there happening at the moment to deny it <laughs> you know what I mean it just seems uh it, what what really what really is astounding to me Rob is when I started prepping ten years ago there were sites that I would go to uh, shtfplan.com, the economic collapse blog.com, which is still a great site, but it will drive you totally nuts. Um, and, and the headlines on those sites were, I mean, they would make my heart race back then, you know, economic collapse, rapid inflation, war between nations, these kinds of things. And uh, what has changed most, Rob, is that those headlines that I used to read are the headlines of today. And it's, it's crazy to see it, you know, even things as obscure as and I don't know if you've recognized or noticed this, but even things as obscure as reporting on solar storms and, and geomagnetic events on the planet. This was total crazy prepper EMP, you know, shut down the grid with a with a blast of energy from the sun that 10 years ago I would only see on prepper websites. And now that stuff is it's everywhere. And um, I don't think it's a bad thing. You know, I, I think you have to be, you know, responsible and disciplined enough to regulate how much of that media you take in because it can drive you nuts. I made some serious mistakes in the early days of prepping um, out of just total fear. And uh, so people got to be able to regulate that kind of stuff. But it's good for people to know that, you know, this is real life and these things can happen a lot better than to be sideswiped by what could happen. You know, what could very easily happen. There very easily could be. A, a coronal mass ejection from the sun that time just right could hit the planet, disrupt the magnetic field and maybe shut the internet out for a month, maybe shut the power out forever. You know, those things can happen. So um, luckily we haven't had to experience that, but you know, us preppers, we want to be prepared just in case something like that does happen. We don't want to be caught off guard. So it's about, about being aware but not letting it control and take over your life. Did, you mentioned you had an experience when you first started delving into the, the topic of prepping. Can you tell us about that? Oh, yeah. Well, the best, I mean, the best, the, the best mistake story that I have is um, before I got into all this, I was a chef and I went to college for it and worked, worked in uh, outside of Philadelphia, worked inside Philly. And uh, it was my life. It was my passion. It was great. You know, I was going to do this thing as a chef. I could cook anything. You know, I still can. And reading these blogs had my brain in such a mess because I was a new dad at the time. I was a new husband. We just bought a home. And I had just come to the realization that all this apocalyptic stuff that I loved as a kid <laughs> could happen for real. And uh, I'd read these blogs every day, you know, like people read the news now every day. And one of the things that was going around back in those days was you got to buy hard red wheat. You got to buy this hard red wheat. It stores for 25 years. You can grind it up and make bread. You got to have it because, you know, at that time, the dollar, the big thing was the dollar, the value of the dollar was decreasing. Inflation was going to happen. This was 10 years ago. Now it's happening now. But, you know, the, the dollar is going to be not accepted by other nations and so on and so forth. And uh, I was so petrified that I bought this thing. I bought this pail of, of dry red wheat and um, it came to the house and I remember looking at it and I just said to myself, you know, I have no idea how to cook this. <laughs> I know how to cook everything. You know what I mean? I've been trained to do it both in college and in some of the, you know, with under some of the best chefs in the world. And uh, I bought, I spent money on this thing. I don't even know how to use it. 
but just completely out of fear, out of recommendations from people I didn't know telling me that the world was coming to an end and you better do this now. Um, yeah, I, I stumbled into that out of out of not using my head to sort of parse out what 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 I should do personally, because prepping is super personal, man. It's a very personal thing um, compared to what other people were telling me I should do, you know? Yeah. So um, that, that story is <laughs> a great example. And I think a lot of people think that, um, you know, someone who's, who's thinking like that is paranoid, running around paranoid. And you're a really calm, um, really clear, clearly articulated um, character. So, how do you regulate, you know, how do you take all that information that you want to be aware about, which is some of it quite scary, and yeah. then reg- regulate that and still function in a really, you know, positive, normal way? Yeah, well, I think for me it was about not brushing it under the rug. You know, I think I, I'm, I, think I was the type of guy, and I, I was hitting a real crossroads in my life, Rob, because I was literally a, a new dad. So now I'm looking at the world totally different, right? It becomes a, becomes a 50 to 100 year journey now from me at, at whatever I was, 25 years. I got to think far beyond that. Like, what's in the world going to be like when I'm dead and beyond? And uh, on top of all that, I, I think I would be an anxiety ridden person had I not addressed the things that I felt I had to address that were, you know, could take place on the planet. And um, what I, what I came to realize in 2020 when people were going crazy was my hosts at the Prepper Broadcasting Network, the listeners of the Prepper Broadcasting Network, we were all kind of calm. Once we realized that the pandemic wasn't the pandemic, you know what I mean? Because we have different ideas about the pandemic. You know, we talk a lot about things like avian flu, um, which transmissible, highly transmissible versions of the avian flu can be 60 percent lethal. That's the kind of doomsday pandemic that we worried about in the initial phases of this thing. And we were talking about the COVID-19 virus in January on the Prepper Broadcasting Network of 2020 because we were just starting to hear things about it. Um, But once we realized what was going on and we started to see the public going a little crazy, we we all did kind of a self-check and we're like, I don't feel too nervous or too scared. Do you feel nervous? And, And there was a, because of everything we had done, you know, a lockdown was kind of like, yeah, we got, you know, we'll be fine. We got plenty of food. We got, you know, all the things that we need. Um, one of the earliest things that I did once I I realized that there was a pandemic was I bought a bunch of educational materials from my home because my kids were in public school. So, you know, I was way ahead of that game before they shut the public school down here in Virginia. And, you know, we were just ahead of the curve on it all. So the paranoid preppers became the calm and relaxed kind of population, you know? And I got interviewed a lot that year, Rob. I got interviewed by almost everybody, you know, New York Times, all of them. They all came and asked me questions. And you know what? One one question every single one of those publications asked me was, um, it it was always something along the lines of, do you want to, do you want to have your, I told you so moment, you know? And I was just, I, of course I didn't, because what yeah. good is that? But I was just so amazed that, all the, you know, um, bi- what Business Insider, New York Times, all those people were, were looking to kind of stir that up in me. And I thought that was really interesting, but I didn't give them the, uh, the pleasure of that, of course. But it was a weird moment, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> tell me, did you have a stockpile of toilet paper then? <laughs> well, we, you know, that was something we... we when it comes to personal hygiene, that's something that we always have anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just a, <laughs> if you need it and you know, you're going to need it, then you already have it, you yeah. know, and you have enough of it to address an issue like that, you know? And, and that, that was one of those weird manufactured fear um, symptoms. Yeah. You know, sort of like my hard red wheat, my hard red <laughs> wheat thing just turned 10 years later became the nation's toilet paper thing. <laughs> just what it was you know and uh i'm sure a lot of people store plenty of toilet paper now they learned hopefully 
<laughs> um, Maybe the four pack ain't going to cut it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think the retailers have realized that as well and jacked the prices up. But um, oh, yeah, good point. Speaking, um, you, you know, talking about storing foods and being prepared, I mean, that's not a, um, it still happens today in Europe. Um, yeah, I mean, Switzerland still has laws that you've got to have a bomb rage shelter and you've got to have a certain amount of tin sure, food yeah. stored and et cetera. So that's, that's not uncommon. But what I, a lot of people listen to this program to learn life tips that they wouldn't necessarily pick up at school. And uh, what I wanted to ask is if you had to identify a handful of key things that you would say, listen, these are the key things that you need to be prepared for, what would they be? You mean things you should have or events you should prepare for? Perhaps, perhaps the things you should have around the house or yeah, in, sure. in, in no your problem. lifestyle. Yeah, I think what, one of the easiest and probably one of the most important right now because of the situation of the world is is food in general. You know, shelf-stable food in particular. Um, it's going to be hard probably for the average person in short order to, you know, start big-time growing of food, growing of uh animals in their yard and that kind of stuff that takes some time um, but one thing that you can do right off the bat is start buying a little extra food at the supermarket a little extra of the items that uh, perhaps you buy anyway every week you know buy two to three items that you buy every time you go to the market buy two to three of those items extra you know a great one is just you know tomato sauce and pasta high calorie item in the pasta you know who doesn't like spaghetti and spaghetti sauce, right? Um, there's a great product on the market card called Parmalat here in the States. Um, Parmalat is a vitamin D whole milk, uh, UHT packed milk. Um, and what that does is that allows you to store milk on the shelf for like six months at a time. And it's real whole milk. And trust me, I'm a whole milk sl snob, Rob. I can't drink <laughs> anything but whole milk and I like milk. Um, so Parmalat is a great product to store. Um, there's a product out there called Idahoan potatoes. These are like a powdered potato and they're super cheap, man. They're so unbelievably cheap. They're like 400 calories per pack. They're like 50 cents a pack or 60 wow. cents a pack. And, you know, just those things that you are staples, you know, you know, you're going to eat them. If you don't eat potatoes, don't buy the potato. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, another important one is, is, uh, some kind of fat oil, olive oil, Crisco, that's one that's often overlooked by people. You know, they store a bunch of food, they fill a freezer up with meat, that kind of thing. And they're usually pretty low on, on oils or cook it, some kind of cooking fat. Um, Crisco is incredibly cheap, though. It's terrible for you. But, you know, if you're talking about riding out a three-month situation, probably not going to matter if you're eating Crisco for three months to cook your food in. Um, if you don't have the money to drop on, you know, big metal one gallon containers of extra virgin olive oil and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, when it comes to food, the staples are great. We, we always store things like rice, beans, sugar, flour, um, and uh, any kind of pasta is always good and a big one that we store. Um, but having those staples and knowing how to use them, how to cook rice, that's a big one. Um, I got a big advantage with my chef background so that I can store a bunch of this kind of stuff and I know what to do with it. One thing we've done lately, Rob, that's kind of interesting is I've been given to storing some more um, sort of mixes also. Being a, with my background, I kind of get a little snobbish about using like Bisquick or like pre boxed cake mix. You know what I mean? Um, but the ease of producing a meal, I think, is important in a disaster or emergency, you know? So if you've got, if you've got mixes that are stored in the pantry and they're stored for the long term, then you know, it's probably going to be pretty cool if the lights are out and you're cooking on a camping stove to be able to yeah. just add water to a mix and make some food. Um, personal hygiene is another big one, though. You know, that that's one of those ones where you can really shore it up really easily. Um, but we as Americans just tend to buy it, you know, a little bit at a time for some reason. Things like toothpaste and deodorant and uh you know, soaps and body wash and shampoo, you know, the, the soap market, the hard soap market right now is so good. One of my used to be one of my sort of guilty pleasures, but now it's so cool. Everybody loves it anyway. I can just come right out and say it. I'm a guy who loves fine soaps. <laughs> <laughs> I just lo always have loved fine soaps. I don't know why real soap, you know, and, uh, now it's just blowing up. Everybody's making soap. So, uh, 
you can stack a lot of really good, really nice soap, like enough soap that you'll probably never have to say the word soap again. And that takes a huge burden off of the whole personal hygiene conversation, right? Um, feminine hygiene products, that's a big one. You want to store those, of course. Um, but anything along those lines that you need on a, from a personal hygiene standpoint, it's, it's a big deal. And, uh, you know, we saw that in 2020. I think it just happened to be toilet paper that was the problem, but it could have been any one of those personal hygiene items, right? Razors yeah. or whatever, something along those lines. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, for, for the average American, I think if we're, we're dead honest, you got food and you can keep yourself clean and drink. Um, probably the next most important thing to the average American is, is power. So I would say, <laughs> I would say be able to power the cell phone somehow, yeah. you know, I, it, it's easy to knock the cell phone for the distraction that it is. Um, but it's a powerful tool. You know what I mean? It's definitely a powerful survival tool and it's your number one communications method. There's no getting around that. So, you know, power banks or, um, we always have kept a portable generator on hand, gas powered portable generator. It just, you know, it, it brings the power. It brings the electric, yeah. like the power's out, put the generator on, the power's back on. You know, yeah. and we can power the fridge, we can turn lights on, we can do some things. Um, and Americans like power, it just is what it is. We want to be able to power things up, watch, pass the time watching Netflix on the iPad, whatever. So I think not a lot of people prioritize that even in the prepping community as like a number four. Um, but I think it's a big priority if we're honest with ourselves. You know. Yeah, yeah, and assume uh, presumably fuel and uh, you know I don't I, I would imagine a lot of inner city uh, Americans or even anywhere British Australians won't be carrying a gas canister or a little portable um, cooking device. So I imagine that would have to be fairly high up on the list as well. Yeah, yeah, I um I actually found my per I used to use they're called ratios. I forget what they're actually called, but in the, in the cooking world, that's what they are. And they're these little portable stoves that are powered by propane, one burner. And when, when emergencies would happen here, that's what I would use and cook on one burner with the propane. And I bought one for catering because I used to run a catering business. But since then, um, there's a stove by Col Coleman. It's pretty common. It's called a Triton. And the Triton is a, uh, larger one pound canister stove one pound propane canister stove the larger green canister two burner um and that thing's great yeah i mean i i bought that and i buy a case of fuel each year um because i have an event that i do also side uh, different than this um but i have an event every year that i need that fuel for so i always have fuel for that and i always have that two burner and um you could do anything you know with two yeah. burners in an in emergency like that where your electric stove's not working or your griddle or whatever you use to cook with, you know, yeah. and it's just a highly effective combination that I've found works. Plus, you know, when you go camping, you take it out yeah, to exactly. the, uh, the outdoors, it's also great. You can really whip up some breakfast with that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I live in Florida and that, you know, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a big global event. A hurricane here can knock the power out pretty easily. So that's that's a, it. It's a fairly um, practical thing to keep around the house. So um, before I ask you, you know, what would be the best advice, but what do you think the best, the biggest risks are that we face at the moment in the world? Well, I mean, the biggest risk, obviously, is what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. I mean, that just that's, as soon as that pops up and the potential for nuclear war becomes a thing again. Um, nobody knows how that plays out. You know, you just don't know. I'll tell you one thing, Rob, do you have a, a VR headset by chance? I don't have a VR headset. No, there's an incredible documentary called, um, I'm a big VR fan. Yeah. I, I didn't expect it, but I am. I just, it's really cool technology. Um, but there's a, there's a, and you might be able to watch a documentary without VR. I don't know, but it's called on the day you wake up to the end of the world. And it was actually put together by, um, oh, God, I don't know the woman's name, but it was put together by a woman in Hawaii. Because in 2018, I don't know if you remember this, but they got a, they got a, a fake text. Well, it wasn't a fake text. It was a miscommunication that people that I know say maybe it wasn't a miscommunication, but what? neither here nor there. They got a text that said there's a ballistic missile incoming. Seek shelter. The whole island got this text. 
you can look it up if you don't remember it, but I remember it pretty close because of the things I read every day. So that, you know, everybody in Hawaii is doing their thing. And on that morning, they get a text that says there's a ballistic missile incoming. You need to seek shelter. And uh, mostly everyone who got that text thought that that was pretty much the end. You know, they were going to get nuked. And um, when you watch that documentary, you kind of can get a little taste of people's perspective on on and, and the way people are going to operate if something like that starts to happen. And it it really tells the tale of how quickly and how how severely other nations can get involved because there's a lot of nuclear armed nations, you know, so it, it there could be a nuclear war without America ever even firing a nuclear weapon. You know, I mean, a, I mean, a, a world ending nuclear war, you know, where Poland gets hit by Russia, maybe by accident, you know, just just a lot of possibilities. I don't need to go down the whole list, but there's a lot of nuclear armed nations. Things can go real bad, re- real fast, because uh, according to Dave Jones, the NBC guy, one of our hosts, you know, retaliatory. The goal in a nuclear war is to stop the retaliatory capability of the nation you're attacking. Right. So if I'm going to attack America, my goal wouldn't be oh, let's just blow New York City up and make a state. It would be we need to we need to hit every single spot that we know that has a nuclear weapon that can launch towards us. So, you know, that would include everybody who holds nuclear weapons in Europe also. So I don't know. That's definitely number one, though. That could go real bad. The leadership in America is absolutely frightening at the moment. So I don't know, you know, how that's going to play out. But um, and, you know, that's and we may talk about it later in the in the podcast, but that's why we wrote the book that we were talking about or the PDF is not necessarily a book, but it's, you know, to answer some of those questions, because I know a lot of Americans are really worried about what happens if nuclear bombs start getting launched. I mean, it's or nuclear missiles, but um, that's definitely number one. The, the, the problem with the planting of wheat right now and corn and soy throughout Russia and Ukraine, mostly Ukraine, um, it's probably, probably next to inflation. I, well, it's probably the next biggest thing that we should concern ourselves with right now. Um, because there's going to be a food shortage in the fall of this year, uh, that is going to devastate third world nations and, and affect, definitely affect the price of food in America. You know, it's not going to be the type of food shortage where people in this country will starve to death and die. But it's definitely going to be it's going to have an effect on the price of food across the world. Um, And I think a lot of nations like Africa and India uh, are going to lose a lot of people to starvation. Just because the sheer if you look at the numbers of the sheer amounts of wheat and corn that come out of Ukraine every year that the world depends on, nobody's planting any of that right now because they're at war. You know, so so the harvest that came from the spring that 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 crop that's supposed to go in next is not going to go in. It's not going to be harvested in the fall. It's not going to be available to the world. And I didn't know this until the start of this war, but Ukraine is a, they're a big producer of food for the world. So that's going to have huge implications on mostly Americans cost and maybe some availability, but around the world, if you look at it as a world problem, it's going to be a starvation situation um, for a lot of poorer nations. You know, I didn't know this, but, you know, there are some nations that exist on a 1200 calorie per day, 1400 calorie per day, uh, you know, intake. So they drop below that because of this, that's game over, you know, disease and death is what comes next, unfortunately. So that's a big one. And Hopefully we can figure out a way to stave that off. I was going to say, is the world doing anything to, to mitigate that in advance? I mean, that's something you can predict and we can see there's going to be a shortage. Can I mean, I, slack? yeah, I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's a enough farmable land to just set enough access to seeds. I don't know what, I don't know enough about it, unfortunately, to say, you just throw a bunch of seeds over here, you know, and, and grow that food there. It's an infrastructure thing. You know, you got to have everything you need to do that and bring it to market. Um, so I'd pay close attention to any serious natural disasters that affect growing regions in the world this year too. Yeah. That could be a doozy. We lose a bunch of crops, 
in any of the major growing areas, that's going to be a problem. That's going to exacerbate that problem. Yeah. You know, well, we're already um, seeing what, inflation going crazy. So yeah, that's, uh, that's already happening and likely to continue for some time. Sorry, keep going. Well, that's a big one. Inflation is not going anywhere for sure. And, um, you know, the other thing that's going to really hurt what what Americans have a, available to them is uh, the, this situation in Shanghai, this this lock, lockdown situation. I don't know if you've been keeping yeah. up with that. It's uh, I mean, as far as I can tell, it's about as much a human atrocity as I've ever seen in my life. People just are locked in their apartments and or locked out of where they live and that kind of thing. And uh, it's terrifying to watch i mean whole cities massive cities are cordoned off and quarantined in shanghai to protect from the spread of covid19 and um, people are starving to death people are jumping to their deaths from their high-rise apartments it's wild video to watch but it's happening and um, it's amazing that the world is as quiet about it as it is but down the road, what is most unnerving is, you know, these are the people who go to work to make your phones and make your everything. You know what I mean? These large swaths, hundreds of thousands of people cordoned off, not able to go to work. That's down the line. That's going to have an effect on what, you know, what you can get your hands on Supply because chain. everything's made from in China, you know? So yeah. that's going to be a thing. That's going to make, a, make you know, it's just a supply demand, supply chain issue that's going to affect price. So um, anything you can do up until, you know, up to shore up things for the holiday season and beyond. You know, one of the things we've been saying to get people motivated at PBN is, you know, what you do in 22 uh, will sustain you. Because I think the moves that people make this year, they're going to look back on in 2023 and say, man, I'm real glad that we got those those uh, garden beds put in. I'm real glad that I stored that extra amount of thing or I'm really, you know, I think this year prepping has been a pretty easy go of it. It's been a pretty under the radar, low cost, you know, sort of endeavor. And you've had a lot of time to do it. Um, this is the first time that I've ever really felt like that time might be running out for people to get, get stuff cheap and get lots of it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I think maybe in another year or so, they might look back and say, like, oh, I can't just go get a bunch of this for cheap anymore. You know, yeah. now everything's expensive. So we've been through um, inflations before in the past. It was a huge, huge, uh, um, I mean, we're nowhere near where we were in the, in the 80s. So what would you say to somebody who says, well, we've been through this before and we'll go through it again and we'll come out the other side and it'll be, uh, it'll be fine? I hope. The first thing I would say is I hope somebody figures something out. The the second, because look, I like the world the way it is. Just because I prepare for it a different way doesn't mean I don't love it just the way it is. Yeah. Um, we have fun. You know, I have a family of four and, and we have a good life. We have a good time. I'd have no desire to be donning a gas mask and running through the wasteland with an AR-15 or whatever, <laughs> you know, some prepper fantasy, something like that. That's not really my bag of tricks, but um all that said, I mean, we've we've totally destroyed our currency, Rob. You know what I mean? We've, <laughs> we've just spent too much money and there's no way we can stop spending it. And there's really no, we don't take any action to fortify the U.S. dollar. Uh, what's happening in Russia right now with, their, with them coming out and saying that they'll back the ruble with gold and that they will only take purchases of oil with the ruble instead of the United States dollar is a it's a huge deal i mean it's a it's a huge it's monumental you know because if the world turns away from the u.s dollar as the reserve currency then this kind of inflation will be like child's play you know because the dollar will then use lose its value across the world or at least in some larger places around the world uh, and we can't afford that and and i don't know what kind of bargaining chip we have um where we could tell someone, hey, the dollar is getting more stable and this is why, you know, we're holding on to bonds longer or, or we're going to back it up with gold or we're, you know, how do you back up 20 plus trillion dollars yeah. of debt with gold? And that's just debt. That's not even, you know, the, the value of the dollar itself. So um, I think in 1980, we probably had, we definitely had more of a clear path. There was probably more 
there was more faith in the dollar by far. Um, and I think there was less corruption too. So I don't know. I, I don't see a way that we could really get too far out of it. I think if you really want to go down that hole, I mean, it, it looks to me like the push is for a digital U.S. dollar that somehow is going to f- somehow is going to forgive all that debt or make all that debt null and void. You can look into modern monetary theory if you want to get into that, which is basically what we've been doing. Modern monetary theory is just the idea that you can print money, just print money. And it'll be fine. You know, you print what you need. You take care of the people who need to be taken care of and the planet will just agree with you. So that works until it doesn't work. You yeah. know, <laughs> when it yeah. doesn't work, it's the Weimar Republic. It's the uh, the great um, the depression, you know, all over again. Yeah. It's so just, you mentioned the PDF before and we spoke about this before before the program, which is it's about being prepared for. Uh, I, I'll let you explain, actually, because you probably put in better words than I will. But it's, it's written by some very credible people and a really powerful document. So let's let's chat about that for a bit. Yeah, definitely. This um, again, this one of the things we figured out that we hated as a collective network in 2020 and on was scared people. You know, one actually in Aust- Australia was one of these turning points. I seen China ro- launched a satellite and didn't tell anybody that they were launching this satellite. And I watched a video, a home video of a dad who was watching this thing go up in the air and he thought it was a nuclear bomb or a nuclear weapon from China. And he was watching this thing go up in the air. You could hear how scared he was. And, uh, you know, it's from that moment on that we were kind of like, you know, we've got to we've got to leverage the things that we know because all of our hosts know so much. We've got to leverage the things that we know to try to make people less afraid because they're going into a time that they're even if they're not prepared for it, they're going to drive themselves nuts out of fear. You know, it's like it's too much to take in. We've had this sort of slow drip you know, over 10, 20 years where the hosts at the Prepper Broadcasting Network have been in this kind of mess. And and we're just worried about people taking it all in all at once. So it became a motivation of ours to make sure that, you know, we do our best to keep people from being terrified of the world as it changes. And that's where this this book kind of came to life. Uh, We're lucky enough to have a guy on the roster. His name is Dave Jones. Uh, his trade name is the NBC guy, the nuclear, biological and chemical guy. Um, and he earned that title through 25 years in the military, in the army, teaching nuclear, biological and chemical warfare. He was in the army for the entire breadth of the Cold War. He was the guy who did the calcul. I mean, he, as dark as it is, he's the guy who would do calculations to say, OK, if we're going to drop a bomb, where do we drop the bomb to get the most casualties? You know, those were the their calculations that are built into his brain because that's what he learned and that's what he taught. Um, so I sat down with him and said, hey, let's put together a document, you know, not necessarily a book. We're not looking to write a book and sell a book and all that. Let's put together a document that we can give to everybody, anybody who wants it, um, that basically would look like a frequently answered questions or something along those lines. Questions about nuclear war in this modern age. And what people should do, um, not necessarily, not necessarily a prepping book like make sure you go out and buy this, this, and this, but more along the lines of, what do I do if there's radioactive fallout, or uh, how do I deal with radiation? Do I need a fallout shelter? Do I need a gas mask? You know these kinds of questions that I think are actual questions people worry about, and. And they want answers. They don't want shopping lists because some people can't afford it. I mean, a good gas mask is $250 for one, you know, so you're talking about a thousand dollar problem to outfit a family of four. And probably a lot of people don't even have that kind of money to deal with a problem that might not even occur. So we look to put together, and I think we have something like 20 different questions in this book. It's called Nuclear War, Prepared, Not Scared, Um, Answers to Americans questions about nuclear war, something, I don't know the exact subtitle, but it's something along those lines. And uh, the whole, the whole table of contents is hyperlinked and every single thing in that table of contents is a question, a uh, barring, barring the biography the autobiography, the intro, that is what Dave Jones background is. So you can feel, you know, validated in all his skills. Um, but it's just a collection of those questions that I think Americans are up at night worrying about. When will a nuclear strike occur? What are the signs of a nuclear uh, strike occurring? And those types of things. 
And, you know, anybody who wants it from the Grind Academy, I'll make sure you get a copy. You feel free to send it off to whoever. No questions asked. It's oh. just uh, something we wanted to give out to people. Yeah, I listen, appreciate that. Um, something in the industry that, that I've now come into, which is the self-development industry, we, we line a lot of to a lot of the study and the science of neuroscience of the brain. Sure. And, and something that... Um, is now starting to come a little bit more mainstream. I think the last 15, 20 years has become a little bit more um, scientific evidence behind the research is about what we train our brain, our brain to do. What we focus on in our conscious brain then drives our subconscious brain. And I think we, we kind of touched on it at the start, but is there a risk that if we, if we put all our focus and our energy onto what might happen that, you know, we, we don't have, a, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen that we can manifest that and actually bring you know, it to life. That's scary. Yeah. That's something I think about a lot. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, it is interesting because as where we're at right now, Rob, is we want a fortified population. That's what we want. We want people, we want the whole nation and eventually the whole world to be in a position where when a mudslide happens, when a hurricane happens or whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, people are ready. People are, people are saying, okay, uh, I had an evacuation plan, so I evacuated. Or we lost our power. We're going to sit here for a couple of weeks. We've got plenty of water, plenty of food. We're going to be fine. Okay. And I know there are some circumstances where no matter what you plan for, like, you know, a tornado, you, you, you could just come out of nowhere and knock your whole world apart. Um, but we think that uh, the average American can probably do better, you know, to be more prepared. And, and that's, what, that's where we want them to be. You know, not necessarily spending all their time worrying about the what could be, but more just putting together a more fortified household that addresses, you know, food, water, first aid, backup power, evacuation plans, some kind of security. Um, because to be honest with you, Rob, we're and it's it's so weird. America is such a weird place in this regard, but we're already kind of living through some really radical times, mm. you know, and it. it I think because we're in it, it's hard to get that perspective. So the manifesting of a the manifesting of a of a rough time, I think that has already happened if it was gonna happen. You know, if you if you took this time, this moment in history and you dropped it on Rob ten years ago, yeah. you would be like, I don't believe any of that. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. You know, what do you mean they disbanded the police? What are you talking about? That would never happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The collection of the collection of that would never happen. Yeah. Seem to be happening all the time. So like it's good advice, I think, to tell people to recognize that things are different now. You yeah. know, it's not to say that they're everything is bad and everything is falling apart. And it's not to say that things can get better. But I think it's important for people to recognize that we're living in a different world now than we were five definitely 10 years ago and we need to prepare for it you know yeah. to keep people safe and and also to avoid more calamity you know because an unprepared population is going to manifest exactly what you're talking about total chaos when things get you know, if things get worse you know so yeah it's true i look i had someone on the other day who was um uh, talking about the homestead that you you, you mentioned at the start oh, of this yeah. program and and I, I certainly buy into this one as well is that we could actually wipe out the insurance industry if we we, we lived a different different way if we just ate better food and, and produced our own food instead of this mass production approach and there's a lot that we could do from a health point of view as well so i think there's a hell of a lot to be said about um about the homestead lifestyle um one of the questions I ask everyone who comes on this program is uh, if you could rewind and uh, James Walton was uh, a kid before you went to school and you could change the curriculum, three things that you would change that you weren't taught at school that you wish you were. Sure. Yeah. I would say uh, cooking being the number one by far, you know, the idea that we all have to eat three times a day and you never learn how to cook unless you seek it out or your mom teaches you or something like that, that's wild, right? Yeah. yeah. Like the, the, the amount of time that you'll use calculus compared to the amount of time that you would <laughs> cook for yourself. It's, it's that's a crazy <laughs> one. Yeah. It's crazy that with cooking is not, you know, but my life has been in cooking. So I see the value and the power in it, but um, fighting is another big one. 
I think we should definitely learn how to fight in school. And I think it would give, um, I think it would eliminate a lot more bullying. You know, I think it would eliminate a lot of that if, if kids were able to do something like jujitsu and able to spar it would also be a great outlet for energy in school. You know, my kids, they, they go to this school where they get to go outside a lot and, um, it's just way better on them. They're both boys and they get to go outside and run around. And, and especially in those early elementary ages, it's like, just seems like a no brainer, you know, should be able to protect yourself. And then as a whole, your population would be more fortified. You know, you would know coming out of 12th grade that they've had X amount of years learning how to fight. So there wouldn't be hardly as many just frail and ineffectual people on the street. Like, oh, that's a that's a victim right there. I know it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just look at people and say, well, they've had four or five years or six years or 10 years of some kind of, you know, martial arts training or something like that. Um, and uh, number three, number three probably would be a better focus on kind of this world that we're inheriting now, which is uh, they call it the language of ones and zeros. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, no. but there's a, you know there's a big, I don't know, trend going on now to talk about technological illiteracy. And I think it's, I think it's warranted. It makes sense. You know, it's what I heard a woman saying that we did a great job at plowing literacy around the world. And I think we have the literacy numbers are pretty impressive, but um, what we're running into now is a, it's like a technological illiteracy. It's an illiteracy of a, a language of ones and zeros that we don't understand. And I think that schools probably have to really have to ch probably change curriculum every year, every two to three years to stay, mm. stay with that, you know, because that's the language of the world. You know, it's almost like the, it, it will be the language of the world, the one language of the world eventually, yeah. you know? Yeah. Good point. Yeah, that's what I would think. Good point. Well, I really appreciate the, um, uh, the, the time and the effort and the, the, uh, the thought, well thought out answers to the questions. Um, I wanted to um, just give anyone a chance to to find you if they want to find out more about prep, prepping or get in touch with you. Uh, can you share like, perhaps a website or social media pages? Yeah, sure. I mean, everything that we do can essentially be found up at prepperbroadcasting.com. We have an integrated uh, podcast player there. Um, but if you're looking to just hear the podcast, and again, we are a 15 host podcast network. We have 11 different shows. We podcast pretty much every day. Some days, two different shows per day. Um, all on the, all on the topics of self-reliance and independence, homesteading, prepping, you know, all those kinds of things. Great people too. I mean, the hosts are from all over the country, you know, from Washington state to Virginia, to New York, to Texas, to Florida, to Louisiana, they're everywhere. And, uh, it brings it adds a great it adds great value to a moment like this when you can get that many different people's take on what's happening. Um, but anyway, prepperbroadcasting.com is the website. And if if you're just into podcasting, any podcast provider, you know, we're on all the major podcast providers. So just search up the prepper broadcasting network. And uh, we play a little bit on social media, but just come find a podcast. <laughs> You'll probably get more of us than than the than you'll get what you need from the Prepper Broadcasting Network through the podcast for sure. Brilliant. All right. Well, listen. Thank you so much for joining today and and sharing your thoughts. Uh, really appreciate it. And I want to wish you a, a fantastic weekend. Thank you, Rob. It was a great time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, not so extreme after all. I live in Florida, and the hurricane season is just about to begin. After recording this episode, I went and bought a portable butane gas stove and some, and some butane canisters. I bought a lamp with a USB charger, two flashlights, reusable ponchos, a bunch of batteries and some practical food supplies. I've already used some of these items during power outages from the storms, so not so extreme or doomsday at all. That's the beauty of choice in the Western world. We all have it and we can all make up our own minds. I want to acknowledge James for choosing to live the life he believes is right for himself and his family. James's choice doesn't harm anyone else and the homestead lifestyle is good for the environment and the health of his children. I want to thank James for joining the podcast and sharing his experience and thoughts. This podcast was designed with one idea in mind and that's to share practical life skills not taught at school and James gave us some useful information. 
Thank you for listening to the Grind Academy podcast today. I want to wish you a fantastic week ahead. Remember to go out there with full intention, keep dreaming, keep grinding, and never, ever give up.